Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to IPRT's Prison Law Seminar. I know people are still joining, but I might just kick off with some housekeeping points for the event. Um, I know there was a slight issue with registration, but hopefully it won't prevent anyone from joining us, and we'll hopefully get any issues ironed out in the next couple of minutes. So just to note that the event in full is being recorded and it will be made available through our website. So we ask that attendees don't record the event themselves, please. The format of the event is one hour and 30 minutes long. And during that, we will hear from the speakers in the following order. So to start, we will have Fianna Nikonaja, Deputy Director of the Probation Service, followed by Professor Tom O'Malley, and then finishing with Professor Cyrus Tata. This will then be followed by a Q&A session at the end of all three presentations. Attendees should submit all their questions in the Q&A box that you can see there at the end of the screen. And we'll do our best to address as many as we can during the Q&A portion of the event. Please note as well that you can't be seen or heard as an attendee. So please do make use of the Q&A box if you need to. Please also note that we won't be dealing with any individual cases in the Q&A. Could I please ask as well that attendees ensure their name is set as their real name and organization so it's clear who's asking a question. However, if you would prefer, there is an option to submit a question anonymously. If anyone loses connection during the webinar, that's no problem. Just go back and click into the link that you received, the second email you received as a reminder today and that will bring you straight back into the seminar as it's happening in real time. So I think soon as we're a little a few minutes late, I'll start the seminar by introducing our first speaker. So our first speaker today is Fina Yukineja. Fina is a deputy director with the probation service. She leads the director, directorate of operations for prisons and reintegration, which includes delivery of probation services in prison, community service, social inclusion, and the Restorative Justice and Victim Services Unit. Fina has extensive experience of criminal justice policy in Ireland. She joined the Probation Service in February 2022, having previously worked for 13 years with IPRT, including three years as Executive Director. So welcome back, Fina, today. She has more than 25 years' experience working in the area of policy and advocacy in Ireland and Europe, with a particular focus on human rights and anti-discrimination. She holds undergraduate and postgraduate degrees from Trinity College Dublin. In 2015, she completed an MA in Political Communications at Dublin City University, where her research interests centred on media, public opinion and policy change. In 2022, she completed the Professional Diploma in Human Rights and Equality at the Institute of Public Administration. The title for Fianna's presentation today is Holding to Account, the Role of the Probation Service in Addressing Harm and Reoffending in the Community. So with just a final thanks again for everyone's patience today, I'm going to hand the floor over to Fina. Thank you, Fina. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much, Helen. So I'm delighted to join you for the IPRT Prison Law Seminar and participate in today's discussion on the topic of alternatives to custody. It's an honour to sit alongside such esteemed panellists and I've read and admired the work of both Professor Tom O'Malley and Professor Cyrus Tata over many years and I look forward to some good discussion a bit later. <clears throat> I strongly suspect we'll have redefined the question and the title by the end of the seminar. So this feels like full circle moment for me because I have such fond memories of being part of the team organising previous IPRT prison law seminars. I know the importance and the impact of these seminars and the very hard work that goes on behind the scenes in making these events happen. So I'd like to thank Saoirse, Helen and the wider team for inviting me back to speak about the work of the probation service and our role in addressing harm and reoffending in the community. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I will outline briefly the role that the probation service plays in managing community-based sanctions, including alternatives to custody, I will give some broad context in terms of policy, legislation and statistics. I will then consider the benefits of community sanctions and some of the challenges we are experiencing. And finally, I will focus on a current priority for the probation service, uh, namely the revitalization of community service. 
So first, a few words about the probation service, sometimes referred to as the best kept secret in Ireland's criminal justice system. And unfortunately, public awareness polling tells us this is true. But I'll return to the need for increased awareness and public confidence in our work later on. So the probation service is part of the Department of Justice with the primary purpose of assessment and management of people who have offended and who are subject to probation supervision in the community. We work within the courts providing assessments to inform sentencing. We work alongside Angarda Siakana in the community managing risk. We work alongside the Irish Prison Service in custody, supporting through care and rehabilitation. We work alongside community based organisations, supporting people to address the factors contributing to their offending. And we work with people who have offended through the development of individualised structured plans to address their offending behaviour and link them back into the community. So you're already here in the repeated word community throughout, and this is at the core of our work. We hold the statutory responsibility for supervising people who have offended in the community. We hold people accountable for the harm they have caused in the community. And we recognise that inclusion and reintegration in the community is key to promoting desistance and, uh, and community safety. Indeed, 35% of the annual budget of the probation service, so just under 20 million euro, is assigned to funding of community based organisations, services and supports in the community, recognising the importance and the role they hold. So, on any given day, the probation service is working with over 10,000 people in the community and around 20,000 men and women in custody who will be subject to supervision post release. As with accelerating prison numbers post COVID, probation caseloads have been increasing both in custody and in the community. Just under half of people in prison under sentence will be subject to supervision on release. Our work is bound on the one hand by sentencing law and practice, which governs the flow of referrals to the probation service. And on the other hand, by penal policy set out by government by way of the Department of Justice. So we work to meet the demands of the courts and also to inform, influence and implement uh, justice policy. So community sanctions and measures are defined in the European rules on community sanctions as sanctions and measures which maintain suspects or offenders in the community and involve some restrictions on their liberty through the imposition of conditions and or obligations. This policy approach is embedded in the Department of Justice uh, review of, penal po of policy options for prisons and penal reform uh, published by government in August 22, which recognises the role that community sanctions can play, and I quote, in addressing criminality, reducing reoffending, and providing protection to the public while holding the individual accountable. So crucially, individuals are held accountable for their behaviour and the harm they have caused but they're also offered a way, a path back to social inclusion and a pro-social way of life. Among its recommendations, the Penal Policy Review recommends reducing the use of short custodial sentences, reviewing and enhancing the operation of the community service model by the probation service, and exploring how the judiciary can be provided with a greater range of non-custodial sanctions. And on this last point, it's also worth noting that the Joint Department of Health and Department of Justice High Level Task Force on Mental Health and Addictions also recommends examining the progressive use of the Probation Act 1907 to again provide the courts with more options, including diversionary approaches. So this slide sets out the community sanctions and measures supervised by the probation service that are currently in use in Ireland by the courts and the other authorities. It'll be a test later. Um, rather than going through the detail and at the risk of oversimplification, so for the purpose of this seminar, I thought it helpful to categorise the sanctions as alternatives to custody, including fully or as part suspended sentences of imprisonment, early prison release, including parole orders and community return, and community service orders, which in Ireland are a direct alternative to imprisonment. And then we have maybe what you might describe as straight community sanctions. We've got probation orders or bonds. We've got community service orders as fines conversion. OK, I admit I'm taking some poetic license, poetic license there, drawing on the original intention of the court, which was not a custodial sentence. And then we also have uh, not reflected here community sanctions under the Children Act 2001. 
So there's a wide range of conditions that can be attached by the courts or, for example, by the parole board to each of these. And the probation service also provide restorative justice interventions and requests from the court. And what links all of these is the role that the probation service plays in supervision, which increases or decreases in frequency and intensity according to risk. And it's really important to emphasize here that the probation service has the skills, the expertise and everyday experience of managing people at high risk of serious harm and people who have committed the most serious offenses. So community sanctions and supervision are not only for low level offending. So in terms of numbers, these are the annual uh, numbers for 2022 on probation caseloads. And this is the daily uh, prison population number just taken from this week. I'll, um, sorry, it's not the annual numbers, it's the annual and then and the total numbers for the prison, excuse me. I'd just like to take a moment to highlight the number of community service orders, 1,288, and the number of custodial sentences of less than 12 months, so 3,095 in 2022. Okay, we'll return to that. So those are the numbers, what are the outcomes? So there is broad national and international policy consensus that community based sanctions are often much more effective than short term custodial sentences in particular. So recent reoffending statistics for the probation service released by the CSO in December demonstrate that 75% of people under the supervision of probation service in 2019 did not reoffend within one year of receiving the order and 53% of those under supervision of the probation service in 2017 did not reoffend within three years of their probation order. These are considerably higher rates of desistance when compared to a prison reoffending stats. So 59% of individuals did not reoffend within one year of custody and 39% did not reoffend within three years of custody. It has to be pointed out here that the figures are not directly comparable. Different people receive different sentences for different you know, categories and severity of, of uh, harm caused. However, it is worth noting that people committed for public order offences, so at the lowest end of the scale, people committed to prison for, for public order offences have among the highest rates of reoffending leaving prison. Also of interest, community service, uh, uh, reoffending rates differ according to the type of order. So for community service orders, 79% did not reoffend within one year. For those who have post-release supervision on release from prison, 85% did not reoffend within one year, which suggests also what we know about the need for supports and etc. on in the first six months to 12 months on release from prison. And also 72% of those on probation orders did not reoffend within one year. So recidivism data, we know, is very limited in its outlook and it cannot be relied upon as a sole measure of success. However, the difference in efficacy rates is important and consistent with international comparative studies of this nature. And beyond reoffending, the positive benefits linked with community sanctions include, first, that community sanctions managed by the probation service are designed to prevent isolation they're aimed at engaging individuals in pro-social activity within the community. Sanctions such as community service orders incorporate an important community payback component, ensuring individuals take responsibility for the harm caused by the crime and placing reparation at the center of the response to criminal behavior. So in addition, while serving their sentence in the community, individuals may be referred to a range of services aimed at addressing their needs, which are often at the core of the offending, such as drug dependency, mental health difficulty, social and economic exclusion. Certain disposals under the Probation Act do not carry a criminal conviction and therefore do not include what can amount to an additional punishment that can long outlast the original sanction. And there is also overt or implicit consent or choice in many community sanctions, which also builds agency. So finally, the work of the probation service is informed by the values, principles and ethical standards of social work. Probation practice in Ireland is informed by the risk need responsivity model, which is proven to lead to higher rates of efficacy for offender assessment and rehabilitation. So I am just going to go back a slide to go back to return to that comparison between community service orders, 1288 in 2022, and short-term imprisonment at above 3,000. So 
An area of priority for the probation service over recent years is to maximise the potential benefit of community service in the Irish criminal justice system and to reform and revitalise the current operating model. The community service order, which I now call the CSO, because reduce the word count, um, in Ireland, it was introduced in 1983 as a punitive measure to address concerns relating to prison overcrowding, rising crime rates and humanitarian concerns. In more recent years, the, repar the reparative and rehabilitative potential of the sanction has been realised and come to the fore. A CSO may be imposed as a direct alternative to a custodial sentence for people aged 16 years and above, and it requires a person to conduct unpaid work in the community of between 40 to 240 hours in lieu of a prison sentence. So it has to be of direct benefit to the community. Since 2011, the courts are required to consider community CSOs in lieu of sentences of 12 months or more. But it's important to emphasise that community service can and is handed down for higher levels of harm too. In 2021 and 2022, about 12 to 13 percent of community service referrals came from the circuit court. Further to this, integrated community service um, allows for up to a third of community service hours uh, to be dedicated to education, training or treatment. And now, OK, so pause, so that's what it can be. But despite successive attempts to expand the use of the sanction in Ireland via legislative amendments, community service orders remain highly underutilised across Ireland. A concerning trend over years is that the numbers of community service orders imposed by the courts have been dropping from 2,791 in 2019 to 1,288, as we can see in 2022, with an increase back to 1,595 in 2023, which is the, the direction of travel is positive, but we're still only about halfway along that journey. Now, certainly COVID-19 and the disruption to the courts has had some impact here, and we are seeing similar trends in other jurisdictions. However, this trend indicates that deeper issues relating to the perception, uh, purpose and functioning of the CSO are impacting its potential as an alternative to custody. We don't know why the sanction is not used more, but we welcome that the Department of Justice has commissioned research to understand judicial decision making in the area, and we look forward to its publication later this year. What we do know from two comprehensive reviews commissioned by the Probation Service, um, an evidence review of community service in 2021 and an operational review in the year just past, is that, first of all, there's a wide lack of awareness of the sanction and its benefits among the judiciary, legal professionals and Garda Síochána and the general public. There may be a perception that community service does not meet the needs of repeat clients with complex needs or who are in crisis before the courts. We found out that the integrated community service option needs to be evaluated to understand its current usage and outcomes and to inform future development of its potential. And we know that there is untapped potential in terms of restorative justice aspects and pathways on to work, education and training and completion of community service order. So the review of community service took place over three phases. In 2021, the evidence review examined the policy, models of practice, research and innovation in Ireland and internationally. The review highlighted the opportunity the community service provides to support desistance, reparation and build personal capacity. And it recommended that a desistance informed approach to community service be embedded inclusive of restorative justice and social justice approaches. It's available online and I highly recommend everybody to read it and for a legal audience, chapter four in particular. So then in 2023, the service completed a, an operational review of the, the operations of community service, and that includes recommendations that support strengthening and expanding community service operations, again informed by the principles of desistance, restorative justice and social justice. And arising from both the evidence and operational reviews, we have developed the New Directions Implementation Plan, which aims to deliver on actions informed by both reviews. So the New Directions Implementation Plan has a clear goal and vision as set out on the screen. I'll, I'll take a minute to read them because they're important and get to the centre of it. So our goal is to deliver community service as a robust sanction, which is accessible and used appropriately and consistently across all courts nationally, both rural and urban, 
and which supports a demonstrable uh, reduction in offending by promoting community payback and community reintegration. And then the second piece, our vision, is one of partnership with communities across Ireland to foster ownership of the solution to offending behaviour and also ownership of the community's role in the desistance journey after the sanction has been completed. So the implementation plan centres around nine core objectives which are detailed here. For reasons of time, I won't go through these now, you can read them later, <laughs> you're welcome. But I observe that we are mindful of the risks of net widening, the importance and opportunity of victims' considerations, and the role of the community of ownership of the solution of, to facilitate reparation for the harm caused and reintegration of persons who have caused harm. Embedding a principled approach to community service, policy, practice and structural innovations underpins the implementation plan and specifically the principles of desistance, restorative justice and social justice, along with community. I think I've, you know, you could play bingo with this. I keep mentioning them and there's a reason for that. This tripartite strategy was the core recommendation of the evidence review and is focused on a long term reduction in reoffending and interrupting those intergenerational cycles of disadvantage and crime. So what do we need to deliver on policy objectives to increase the use of community sanctions as a real alternative to custody? In order to deliver effective alternatives to custody, however we might define that, the probation service needs adequate resources and capacity to do so. Although the 1907 legislation, which is older than the state, has proven uh, to be a good piece of legislation with sufficient clarity and flexibility to endure this long, we look forward to the progress of the Community Sanctions Bill, which will provide the legislative framework to guide probation's work in the 21st century. Over recent years, the probation service has experienced difficulties in the recruitment of probation officers within community settings and in prisons. This is a challenge shared by social work, the social work uh, sector as a whole. So in order to address this issue, the service has received additional budget by the Department of Justice to strengthen its staffing. Recruitment has been ongoing to fill vacancies across the service. And we have recently introduced a new probation assistant grade, building capacity and diversity in our skill sets. Finally, we don't want to be the best kept secret in the criminal justice system. And so promoting public awareness and engagement strategies with key stakeholders, including the judiciary and welcoming events like today are among our priority tasks. So thank you for your time. I really look forward to listening to the other speakers and to taking questions later during this session. Fiona, thank you so much for that fascinating um, presentation. I'm looking forward as well to the Q&A session after. I think it'll really um, bring through a wealth of experience there in the Q&A to kind of flesh out some of those themes you touched on. So thank you. Um, moving on then to our second speaker today, it's Professor Tom O'Malley. And I'll just give a short introduction to Professor O'Malley before I hand the floor over to him. So Tom O'Malley is a senior counsel and a retired professor of law at the University of Galway. As both academic and practitioner, he specializes mainly in criminal law, criminal justice and sentencing. He has published extensively in these areas. His books include The Criminal Process, Sexual Offences and Sentencing Law and Practice. His most recent book, Sentencing, A Modern Introduction, which is an academic textbook on sentencing, will be published shortly by Claris Press. As a barrister, he's argued several of the leading sentencing guideline cases before the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal. He was a member of the Law Reform Commission from 2013 to 2020 and is currently a member of a government appointed working group charged with reviewing the civil legal aid scheme. The title of Tom's presentation today is Alternatives to Imprisonment for Moderately Serious Offences, Problems and Issues. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor over now to Professor Tom O'Malley. Thank you. Sorry, Professor O'Malley, I think you're on mute. Sorry, thank you, you very much. Perfect, thank you. So thank you for that, Helen, and uh, delighted to be able to talk to you today uh, from a distance, and indeed to Fiona as well. I certainly found that a very, very informative presentation uh, about the probation service, which uh, she said is probably uh, the best kept secret in the uh, 
criminal justice system, though it shouldn't be. Um, first thing I would say, and I think to the main points I need to make, is that this is uh, certainly a very timely seminar to have uh, because of the state of, of our prisons, and more specifically, the level of overcrowding within the prisons. Um, I, I don't know uh, to what extent there's an awareness of this, but if you look at the daily prison figures that are published by the prison service, uh, it is in many ways quite alarming. For example, on the 26th of February of this year, that is last Monday, there were 4,843 uh, prisoners in custody. That meant the prison system overall was operating at 108% capacity. Compare that to two years ago when there were about 3,900. So when it was then operating at 90% capacity. So we have seen an increase of almost 1,000 over the space of two years. And in fact, again, at the moment, going by last Monday's figures, there were only three prison institutions in the country operating at below 100% capacity, two of them at 98% and the other at 97%. I suppose one of the most telling figures has to do with the women's prison in Limerick, which, of course, last year was operating at an extraordinarily high level of overcrowding. But a new prison was opened uh, in autumn of last year. I had the opportunity to visit it, in fact, before uh, uh, it was formally opened, and it seemed to be very impressive indeed. Uh, but already that is operating, and it had far more, it has a far greater capacity. I think it has a capacity of 56, but that is now back operating at 114% uh, capacity. So therefore, um, as I say, this, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of public awareness of this. I know the IPRT are very aware of it. It, it certainly isn't the fault of the prison service because that has to accept, accept any uh, of the committees to her uh, sent by the courts. But it's a matter that should be, in my view, getting more attention than it is. And it's difficult to be optimistic about this changing. Some people say we're dealing with a kind of a post-COVID bounce. There may be a bit of truth in that. But when you look at the uh, volume and the, and the nature of the cases that are coming before the courts and that are lining up before the courts at the moment, uh, and this is likely to continue, it's difficult to foresee any improvement in this situation in the foreseeable future. And indeed, I suspect it may get a lot worse before it gets better. And with, Therefore, that's, that brings us to the question of what is the solution to this? Well, of course, one solution that many people would uh, advance is you simply build more prisons or you make more prison space available. And that's something that we have to contend with as a possibility. But there are, of course, disadvantages to that too. And therefore, one of the questions that I'm trying to address here is to ask, are there strategies that can be adopted that would, if you like, reduce the level of imprisonment? Uh, quite at the same time, without at the same time uh, preventing the courts from imposing, uh, if you like, proportionate punishment and measures for the cases that come before it. So uh, one possibility, something that I have been trying to address in other work uh, in recent times, is to look at the whole question of moderation in sentencing. And I say that excuse me, for a particular reason, which is that over the past several decades now, uh, let's say since the 1980s, but right down to the present day, much of the debate has been about consistency in sentencing. And again, that's a very relevant and current question in this country, because after all, uh, in 2019, the Judicial Council Act established a special committee called the Sentencing Guidelines and Information Committee, which is at work. Uh, and the objective is to draw up guidelines that would have the broad uh, objective of generating more consistency in the uh, selection of sentence. But, of course, already the courts, both the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, have been laying down uh, some guidelines as well in that regard. Uh, but, as I said, the, the general purpose is to bring about more consistency. But, of course, consistency is doesn't necessarily mean either severe or lenient sentencing, what, it, what it, all it says is, or all it requires is, that whatever level of sentence is imposed, they should be uh, similar offenders should be treated in a similar way. 
There was a very good kind of description of it in a book, a very fine book indeed, by Lyndon Harris, published in England a few years ago, on consistency in sentencing, where he makes the point that consistency is an agnostic concept, which I thought was a good way of putting it, in the sense that a very severe system can be quite consistent and a very lenient system uh, can be quite consistent. But it doesn't do anything necessarily to moderate the level of prison sentences or indeed other measures uh, that are imposed uh, by the courts. And therefore, we have to ask, can we... Uh, can we do anything to um, uh, or what kind of approach we might adopt to address that? Well, when you look at this at the profile of serving prisoners, it's quite clear that long prison sentences, much more than short ones, are the drivers uh, of the prison population. It is true, of course, and rightly uh, has been uh, addressed by many, and indeed Fiona mentioned it earlier on that, of course, a very large number of committals are for short-term uh, sentences, maybe one to three months, three to six months, and so forth. In effect, very often, this doesn't have, well, it has some effect, obviously, administratively and so on, but on any given day, going by the snapshot statistics, the number of people serving short sentences who are in custody in prison is actually very, very low indeed. It's only a tiny percentage of the population. The real driver is the uh that consists of the longer sentences principally of course life sentences followed by drug sentences followed by sex offense sentences and um therefore we have to look at uh certainly the substitution of short-term sentences with community-based measures that can be sometimes more difficult than it seems even though every effort should be made to do it um Legislation on it tends to be quite ambivalent at times in that it doesn't really ever demand uh, that short uh, sentences be replaced with something else. It's more a kind of an encouragement or a nudging of the courts uh, to do just that. But what I'm looking at here is um, the, and the effectiveness of these sentences, obviously, is an important question as well and how ineffective they can be. Uh, what I'm looking at here is exploring the way in which uh, how viable it is to have alternatives to imprisonment for what I would call low to medium levels of offending. Uh, that is the kind of, of offending, the kind of offences that would ordinarily merit, let's say, sentences of one to three years imprisonment. Because sentenced offenders... In those in, in that category, that are sentenced prisoners, I should say, in that category will typically amount for about 25% of the prison population. For example, in November 2022, which I think is the last snapshot of the pr prison population that we have, there were almost 900 prisoners serving sentences of one to three years out of, at that time, a total sentence population of 3,400. So therefore, is it possible to devise other measures that would have, if you like, the same punitive bite, as the literature puts it, as, let's say, a short term of imprisonment of the, of the level that I'm talking about here, let's say, in the one to three year, uh, in the one to three year category. Um, I'm kind of assuming that for prison sentences above that, uh, that, that is not a very viable proposition, but it may be possible for uh, the category that I am referring to. Now, the short answer to this is that yes, I mean, there is research, academic research, most of admittedly in America, but not just in America, which shows that it is possible to devise sanctions or more commonly, if you like, combinations of sanctions that would have a somewhat similar punitive bite uh, to these kind of shorter prison sentences. Um, it can be surprisingly difficult uh, to uh, rank penalties in order of severity. But there is a lot of research which shows that, for example, offenders who have experience of imprisonment don't always rank imprisonment as the most severe sanction. Some people would prefer a year of prison to, let's say, five years intensive probation, because that can be very demanding for those people who have experienced it. So what I'm going to look at then are, if you like, three problems 
that confront this idea of, if you like, substituting uh, quite severe community-based penalties, and I'm talking about things nowadays like intensive supervision uh, with electronic monitoring and CPS monitoring and so on, which can be indeed very demanding uh, and controlling and punitive, the kind of problems that would be associated with uh, trying to develop a policy of substituting those measures for uh, short imprisonment. The first problem is what I'm calling the expressivist problem, uh, again, of which there is a good deal written. And people who adopt this approach say, OK, it is possible to have alternatives to imprisonment uh, of, the, of this particular kind, but it doesn't have the same kind of stigmatic or censuring effect that imprisonment has. That imprisonment, by virtue of being the deprivation of liberty, and as I say, the kind of stigma that attaches to being an ex-prisoner, these people, who I'm calling the expressivists, would say that prison has an expressive power that no other sanction or combination of sanctions can have. So in a sense, when these people look at imprisonment, they say, in a sense, nothing compares to you, even if it is only for five, seven hours and 15 days or whatever it was in the song. But um, th there is that approach. And I suppose, and again, something I'll be coming back to in a moment, it's a question of to what extent we can change public attitudes in that regard. Then there is what I would call the equity problem, which is a serious one. And that is the kind of situation where uh, it is possible for uh, or, or this kind of idea of having, if you like, a combination of severe uh, community-based penalties is possible for some or more possible for some offenders rather than others. For example, uh, if we take white-collar offenders, which are some people that are a group that have attracted a fair bit of attention in recent times, and they can be punished very often quite severely without having recourse to imprisonment. They're very seldom dangerous in the conventional sense of the word. They can afford to pay heavy fines. They may be willing to do public service that would be a real and tangible benefit to the community. And therefore, the case for imprisoning them, unless their offences seem very serious, may seem quite over The case against imprisoning them, I should say, uh, may seem quite overwhelming. Um, you know, unless their offences are very serious indeed. The problem is, of course, that this would not be a viable option for ordinary offenders convicted of similar or perhaps less serious crimes. Offenders in this category will seldom, if ever, be in a position to pay substantial fines, and they may not always be suitable for community service. So imprisonment may seem to be the only option there. So this leaves us then with a serious policy dilemma, and in a sense, a serious moral dilemma as well. Because on the one hand, we want to avoid using imprisonment whenever there is a viable alternative. On the other hand, we want to ensure, as far as we can, that the sentencing system is free of the kind of wealth-based and class-based discrimination uh, that would result from a policy of allowing white-collar offenders, but not other offenders who engaged in broadly similar conduct, uh, to be spared imprisonment. So the answer to this dilemma is by no means apparent. Uh, jailing white-collar offenders or jailing more of them, as some people advocate, might be one solution. But, of course, a better solution is to try to ensure that alternatives of a suitable nature are available for what I'm calling the ordinary offenders uh, just as much as for white-collar offenders. And then there is the third problem, which, again, would be very well known to anybody who deals in this area of uh, community sanctions, and that is what you might call... Well, we often talk about it as the net widening effect, but I'm talking about a different kind of net, and that is the net through which people fall through. Because um, as the conditions that attach to various community-based sanctions and especially supervision become more numerous and more onerous, the more likely they are to be breached. The more intense the supervision, the more likely that technical violations will be detected. And then imprisonment is often the most common sanction for breach. It is, if you like, the default sanction. So unless carefully designed and monitored, community sanctions will become, for many offenders, a prelude to imprisonment rather than an alternative to imprisonment. And, of course, in the United States, again, 
probation systems, as we know, have come in for criticism, severe criticism for this reason, where people can be sent to prison for technical violations. Uh, in the United States in recent years, up to 45% of prison admissions have been for technical violations of parole and probation. Uh, 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 of, of parole and probation. So therefore, um, I don't know if I have any time left, but uh, all, I know that all I have done here is to raise problems about the uh, trying to substitute uh, trying to substitute uh, community-based measures, however severe they have to be, for uh, prison for medium level terms of imprisonment. But I would just finally, finally go back to one point I touched on at the beginning, and that is, and I know it's not probably directly relevant to our discussion today, but I think it's relevant to anyone who's concerned about uh, the growth in prison, uh, of the prison population, and that is to try to encourage more moderate sentencing. And this is something which requires if you like, cooperation from all of the different criminal justice agencies. We always have to remember that sentencing is not just an event that happens when a judge decides on the sentence. The sentence a person gets and the sentence a person serves is determined by many other actors within the system, starting off indeed with the legislature when it uh, specifies a maximum sentence, which of course now is, is likely to be quite high. It depends on what charges are brought by the prosecution. Obviously, it depends on the judicial sentence, but it also depends on parole arrangements in terms of when people actually uh, get released. And the idea of trying to bring in more moderation into sentencing requires, if you like, the collaboration of all of these branches of government or branches or agencies of the criminal justice system. Obviously, they do have to operate with independently of each other. But at the same time, when it comes to broad policy approaches, there can be, uh, they can, if they have the will, develop a degree of consensus in that regard. And that's why I just say this in conclusion, that's why I am somewhat concerned about guidelines, uh, because guidelines usually have to be drawn up uh, by reference to the maximum sentence that is prescribed by statute. And therefore, if they do that rigidly, they will uh, probably lead to heavier rather than lower prison sentences, as it happens. I'm awaiting judgment in the case I was in in the Supreme Court a few weeks ago, where I was advocating that the judicially developed guidelines for burglary should be reduced to what they were, to the levels at which they were set by the Court of Appeals. So and we have to wait to see what the Supreme Court will say about that. But um, again, uh, even small, modest reductions in many of the prison sentences that are being imposed could probably have quite a beneficial impact on the prison population. And we mustn't forget that, you know, the experience of imprisonment, um, whether it's in overcrowded conditions, whether it's in humane conditions, whether it's in conditions that allow people to uh, prepare for release, um, you know, is crucially important in terms of the likelihood of recidivism after people are released. So there are just the observations I have to make, and I look forward to any questions afterwards. Super. Thank you so much, Professor Amali. That was really interesting. I said this is shaping up to be a great Q&A session afterwards, and at the rate we're going, which is fantastic. So just to lead on to our final speaker to wrap up the lineup, we have Professor Cyrus Tata. So Dr. Cyrus Tata is a professor of law and criminal justice at Strathclyde University Law School in Scotland. For over 25 years, he has conducted and published research into various aspects of criminal justice decision making, as well as public and victim attitudes to and perceptions of criminal justice. Cyrus has served as advisor to governments and organisations in several countries, including the senior judiciary and the court service of the Irish Republic. His books include Sentencing, a Social Process, Rethinking Research and Policy, and his latest publication is Criminal Justice and the Ideal Defendant in the Making of Remorse and Responsibility. The title of Dr. Tata's presentation for today is Ending the Revolving Prison Door. And with that, I'm going to hand you over to Professor Tata. Thank you. Well, thank you, Helen. And um, thank you to IPTR, to Sertia, 
and um, all the colleagues for asking me to join you today. It's a pleasure to be with you and to be asked by such an august organization. But thanks, most importantly of all, to all of you. I've had a look at the attendee list and I can see that you're a very interesting, quite a diverse group of people that have been brought together for this seminar from a range of different um, criminal justice sectors. Um, and I think that's absolutely wonderful. I'm gonna ask you for your forbearance, however, as you can tell, I'm not Irish and I have never lived in Ireland, although I've had the pleasure of occasionally working on different projects with colleagues in Ireland, including Tom O'Malley, who we've just heard from, and others, and working with the Irish Judiciary, Court Service, etc. But I don't know um, often the context. So um, forgive me if some of the things that I might say about what's been happening more on this side of the water may or may not translate very well to what's happening or been happening on your side. Although from my discussions, um, it seems like some of the issues are, are fairly similar, although you have had historically a lower prison population than uh, England, Wales and in Scotland. And we are one of the leaders in Europe, Western Europe, and have been for many years. I understand that the population has been rising. Um, and my question really is to ask not so much how can we reduce the absolute numbers of people in prison, because I don't necessarily have a problem with people who have committed serious offences being in prison at all, um, but rather the, that group of people, not the medium group that Tom was talking about, but the low group, that most people would say, that most practitioners, and indeed often sentences, will say, I don't really think this person should be going to prison, but there's really nothing else for them. So the question is, how can we reduce the use of imprisonment as a society in the longer term, as a society in the longer term, for less serious cases, for those kinds of cases where people pretty much agree, and as I'll explain, the public, in fact, will often agree when they when they look at it closely, um, don't need to be in prison, shouldn't be in prison, is actually damaging and counterproductive for them to be, for us to use the incredibly expensive resource of imprisonment and actually only makes matters worse for everyone. So the target of my critique, I mentioned the long term, is not, I know many of you here are practitioners, professionals, or judges, probation office, prosecutors, defense, um, third sector, and so on. My target of critique is not you. It is not individual practitioners. It's too easy in my view to blame individual practitioners for in a sense, systemic problems. My target of critique has been the failure of governmental policy, certainly on this side of the water, um, possibly on your side as well, over many decades. And my argument will be that we have been trying to do the same things, certainly on this side, and I think possibly on your side to some extent, for five to six decades, and actually have only have, have achieved no success, and I will argue that our attempts to do so have been counterproductive. So I'm really trying to think about a longer term solution here that we may, we may need to take 10 to 15 years as our target. And I know politicians and policymakers, sometimes their eyes glaze over when I talk about 10 to 15 years. And they sort of say, Cyrus, couldn't we have something that we can just do next year in the next two years because, you know, a minister's going to move on and so forth. Well, <laughs> There's not really an awful lot one can do in such a short period of time. Remember, we've been trying these things for 50 to 60 years. So actually, 10 years or so is not that long. OK, I'm going to try to share my screen. Always a dangerous task. Um, I'm sure someone will tell me if I fail to do so. Okay, um, I'm assuming everybody can see that. I'm sure someone from IPTR will let me know if not. Um, so the title of my presentation is Ending the Revolving Door. I'm really thinking of that population, those people we all know about them, and those of you who are practitioners know them all too well, which is the people whose chronic needs often outstrip the seriousness of their offending, um, but they fail to turn up to appointments, 
because their chronic needs, their physical health, their mental health, their homelessness, their drug addiction is so chronic and serious. They go back into the court, prison again, another community sanction. They don't make that. They end up back in prison and so forth. What can we do there? I'm going to suggest to you um, that there are three seductive illusions. Three seductive illusions which we have been trying on this side of the water, and I think you may have been trying um, in Ireland for, for some decades as well, to some extent, but certainly on this side. Um, and these three seductive illusions, these are the, the illusions, I suppose, that penal progressives um, tend to reach for and have reached for. And my argument is that not, not only have they been unsuccessful, they've actually been counterproductive. The first is, and I'll then I'll just summarize these now and then we'll go through them. The first is essentially don't tell the public. We, the knowledgeable elite, liberal elite, metropolitan elite, as it's sometimes called, we know what to do. Public are really quite ignorant, can't trust them, can't trust the media who always sensationalize things, of course they do. Um, keep them at bay, just don't tell them too much and um, sneak through things that are, seem more progressive and maybe throw a few punitive crumbs to the media to satisfy those urges. The second is um, the argument that if only we had more robust community alternatives, and Fee was talking about this, um, that will replace the use of imprisonment at the lowest end. So people for less serious, the least serious offences of less than a year, for example, um, we can replace that with community sanctions. And the third is that what we need to do is to ensure that prison is the last resort. And if we could ensure that prison is the last resort, we'll use it less. And I'm going to suggest that all of these um, are illusions, they're seductive illusions, they sound sensible, but actually have failed and have been counterproductive and we need a new approach. The first, very briefly, um, the, the first illusion, don't tell the ignorant public what we're really doing. Um, the media sensationalizes things, we know that. We know that they um, hugely over-report violent uh, offenses and often exaggerate them and all the rest of it. We know that's problematic. So one argument would be is, well, keep things secret. You know, we, in a kind of paternalistic way, should know what to do. I understand, I know that this is a British reference, but I know from my family in Ireland that you do get a bit of UK TV for good or for bad, and some of you will know this character, Sir Humphrey, senior civil servant in the Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister series from way back, really exemplifies this idea that Sir Humphrey always felt he knew best. He uh, was always deeply suspicious of the public and really felt that you should keep things to the elite particularly the civil service, and particularly himself, <laughs> um, and keep the ignorant public at bay. Don't tell them too much. Um, and don't, if you're trying to do something rational, don't discuss that. Don't let the public know, because it'll just, um, the public won't be able to understand it, and they'll just want, for instance, uh, the most vengeful punishment. The problem with that is, of course, that sooner or later, this gets found out. And we know that the media and indeed the public, the key complaint of all, the, the most serious complaint they make, is a pervasive sense, not, not even of leniency, but of dishonesty. That we promise one thing, those of us who are in this elite, we promise another, one thing, but we actually deliver another. That we claim to be punitive, but we're actually doing something else. And that's often the complaint of victims, report after report says they feel, quotes, let down, i.e. they were promised one thing and another thing happened. So it's actually that sense of dishonesty and almost a sense of betrayal that upsets people. And this leads, of course, to criminal justice generally, and you will know this, many of you yourselves, as essentially kind of like a sitting duck, a target for the easiest criticism possible by politicians who want to make political capital um, and by the media. What do we do? There are a couple of strategies that are often tried, a couple of possible responses, both of which are disastrous. The first is, let's stick our heads in the sand and hope it will go away. I think that's perfectly understandable as individual professionals. 
Um, you can't, of course, be at the beck and call and the whim of the media just because there's been a high profile case. You have to do what you think's right. But collectively, organizations like the judiciary, um, like the probation service, like the prison service and so on, do need some kind of collective response to these criticisms and have to have a strategic response rather than being at their mercy. The second strategy, which I'm sure you know very well, is that when, and there always is, and there always will be, a some shocking case comes to light, and there appear to have been failings or reported or perceived failings by the justice system, that everyone runs around like a headless chicken saying, it wasn't our fault, it was somebody else, it's another agency's fault, it wasn't us. And of course, none of that is going to help confidence in criminal justice. I've done a fair bit of work in criminal justice uh, attitudes, public attitudes to criminal justice, public confidence in criminal justice, et cetera, uh, in recent years. And I would say uh, a couple of things very briefly about it, which is one, well, what's the solution? Well, in fact, when we do the research into it, we find some quite interesting findings. There's been a little bit of work in Ireland, I understand, not a great deal, but around the world, and it shows a fairly common and consistent picture, which is first, um, although if you ask members of the public in top of the head opinion polls, do you think we should be tougher on crime? Of course, they say yes. You know, just about everyone would say yes to that. It's almost impossible to say no. Um, but, you, but in serious research, which began from the sort of 90s in Canada and England, Wales and so on, through the 2000s, et cetera, and we've done work in Scotland, when you actually give people scenarios which are similar to the kinds of scenarios or actual scenarios, anonymized scenarios, of the kinds that the courts have to sentence and say to people, OK, have a look at these facts. What do you think? And what difference would this make? Would this make? That they, the kind of preferred sentence that they have in mind, you say to them, what do you think? What kind of sentence should ought to be passed? They actually pass something which is not nearly as punitive as one might think, but they believe, they perceive the courts and other elements of the justice system to be far more lenient than their preference. And where we have the data to show this, we can show that actually people's perceptions of leniency are incorrect. So if I could just show this little diagram. You need three things to tell a really powerful story. And uh, I know Ireland is trying to work on the third element. In Scotland, we need to improve our third element as well, which is you need data or information about people's preferences. You can do that through research. You ask people about a case scenario. What should happen in this sort of case? These are the facts. And they tell you the sorts of sentence they have in mind. And then you ask them, what do you think actually normally happens? What sorts of sentences do the courts pass in your opinion? and they will suggest something far more lenient than their preference. And then where you've got the data, where you've got good quality data about the reality, you can then say to people, as has been shown in other countries, well, actually, the perception you have of this leniency is not borne out by the reality. In fact, the sorts of sentences you would like to see passed are quite similar to what the courts are doing anyway, but you believed that the courts are far more lenient. And where we've been able to do that, people are quite taken aback and quite surprised and quite pleased and relieved to hear, oh, courts aren't as lenient as we thought they were. That's very interesting, they say. So you have the ability to tell a really powerful story. Now, what actually happens in practice, the data on that in some countries isn't great. And in Ireland, it isn't great. And I know the sentencing uh, guidelines and information committee that Tom mentioned, and we. Tom and I worked together on the report to suggest ways that data could be improved because Ireland needs to have data on normal patterns of first instance sentencing to say, here's what typically happens. But people have this perception of really quite extreme leniency, which is often a misperception. And where you've got those three things, you can tell a really powerful story to boost public confidence rather than having to take the Sir Humphrey approach and try and hide things away from people, saying we know best, and inevitably people feel angry when they feel betrayed and they feel deceived and taken for fools. That approach just doesn't work. Okay, um, 
the second issue uh, of the, the second illusion which has been tried but has been counterproductive. And that is, the second illusion this is very common in policy circles around the world and it's an understandable assumption. One would think, well, if we want to try to reduce the use of imprisonment at the lowest end, especially for people who are non-violent, non-dangerous, whose needs are just quite severe, um, and often more severe, you know, more serious than the nature of their actual offending, but their lives are so-called chaotic. Um, what we need to do is to have, quote, more credible and robust community alternatives. And what we simply need to do essentially is to kind of try to replace that the cases that are getting at the very lowest end sentence of visit of imprisonment the people that everyone agrees actually aren't a danger and shouldn't really be in prison but nobody else nobody really knows what else to do with them because nobody wants them and if we had more robust community alternatives we could substitute community alternatives for imprisonment and that would reduce the prison population, but especially the churn. I mean, Tom's absolutely right to have pointed out that it's the long term prisoners that really drive the overall population. But a much bigger issue also, and prison administrators, I'm sure, will tell us, and people who work in prisons, is actually the churn and the experience of those first few weeks for people in prison that can be very damaging or experience of remand and so on can be can be can be can stay with people for a long time. And you mentioned the stigma and so forth. It's absolutely right. So that's the hope. But what's been the reality? We've been trying this for some five to six decades. Well, there's quite a lot of emerging evidence now from both sides of the Atlantic over about the last 10 years, because what we've seen is a rise in both the prison population and, short, and the use of short-term imprisonment for relatively less series of serious offences, and a rise, a dramatic rise in the use of community penalties. So yes, the use of community sanctions has gone up, but so is the use of the lower end prison population. So scholars and policymakers have been puzzled by this, what's going on? So the research in the last 10 years or so, and I've mentioned a couple of key examples on both sides of the Atlantic there, has shown essentially this, which is the use of community sanctions has gone up in net effect overall of course one can always find examples where individual examples where a prison sentence would have been passed but its community but overall statistically the net effect has been a huge growth in the use of community sanctions which have been getting tougher so called more robust while at the same time the prison population has been growing but what has really shrunk in many countries has been the use of financial penalties. So many cases which used to get financial penalties have got community sanctions, perhaps rightly, because often the fine is not often proportionate to income. There are all sorts of difficulties with making it so. But what's happened is people end up going up a step in the penal ladder. And particularly those people whose lives you know, are frankly a bit of a mess and they're, they, they're really suffering in many ways. So they're not dangerous, but they're so-called chaotic. They're homelessness, they're homeless. They've got addiction problems, mental health problems, physical health problems, all sorts of issues. They've committed some relatively minor offense, but they fail repeatedly to turn up for community appointments. And then eventually those supervising them, because they've been encouraged to be more robust and to show that they don't stand for any nonsense, now we would use the term breach, breach the, the individual I understand in Ireland, you don't use that, but essentially send them back to the court. So I use, I think use different verbs for this, send them back to the court to say, this person's not complying. We, there's nothing more we can do. We can't deal with them. And of course the court says, well, it's gotta be prison then. You're not complying. And it was an alternative and you've had your chance. And these people end up in prison and of course, Prison does nothing to prepare people for the outside world and they only end up worse. Uh, and so the cycle goes on. So that revolving door actually gets worse, not better. So we thought that community, robust community alternatives would be the answer. But unless you put in what I would call limiting proportionality measures, which I'll come on to in a moment, that, will that, that problem will get worse by using community sanctions more. 
that community sanction and effect, as Tom was mentioning, can become a funnel into prison, an unintended one. The seriousness of the offending didn't warrant it in the first place for the courts, but that's where people end up for want of anything else. The third seductive illusion is that prison should be the last resort. Sounds very progressive, sounds great. Should try everything else, prison's the last resort. Um, it's very common in domestic law and international law among NGOs, governmental policy, and we've been trying this for a long time. Howard Leake in Scotland says, um, essentially in its mission statement, that prison should become a measure of last resort. And even the wonderful IPTR, who I think, I think is a fantastic organization, says our vision is a just humane island where prison is the last resort. I want to suggest to you, as progressive as it sounds, the idea of prison as a last resort actually means prison becomes the default for us as a society. And again, I'm not blaming individual practitioners who have to deal with what they have to do, but we're talking about a longer term plan here if we want to do anything about this. Really, this idea of last resort has been around for five to six decades to the days of the 70s when Tom and I were grooving to chic. Um, and there was even before that in the 60s, the life of Brian was it. And on this side of the water, people who presented the weather look like this. Policy of last resort has been tried for over 40, in fact, indeed 50 years. And here's an example from Scotland. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Use prisons as sparingly as possible. It's inevitable for violent offenders. We must question whether short periods of custody are appropriate. Who said this? Well, it was a minister who was in charge of Scottish criminal justice, um, a kind of liberal conservative, Malcolm Rifkind, in 1980. And he wasn't the first to say this, but he pushed for it quite hard. In many ways, very, you know, he was trying to be progressive, he was trying to do the right thing, he was trying to be rational, but he still had this idea of last resort, I think, doesn't help us. We should make prison more unlikely, except as a last resort. Don't use prison except where there's nowhere else to take them. And that's why I've put in bold and underlined, except where no one else wants them. Then prison is always there. So prison becomes essentially the backdrop. It almost becomes, not that any individual wants this, a sort of obscene last sort of safety net in the welfare state. We are really not that different from the Victorians in using prison as essentially the whole house. And as I say, I don't mean that about any of us as individuals, but that's what we're doing as a society. When nothing else seems to be there and no one else wants them because this, their, their lives are so difficult, prison is always there. There was talk in Scotland, you may have heard this, about Scotland being more progressive and uh, the idea of Scotland being more socially democratic and so forth. And we had, you met, some of you may have heard about this, a presumption against short sentences. Maybe that's the answer. And we had legislation in our 2010 Act, which was enacted a few, in, implemented a few years later. A court must not pass a term of imprisonment for a term of less than initially three months, six months, then it got extended to 12, unless the court considers that no other method of dealing with the person is appropriate. But it's that all legislation is rightly caveated, and, but this is about as permissive as you could get. I ask you in all seriousness, who makes a decision in life which is significant, which they consider to be inappropriate? Which sentencing judge would pass a sentence which they do not consider appropriate? And the sentencing bill in England and Wales is essentially doing something similar. It's a bit more, it's got different language, but essentially doing the same thing. Um, this is basically last resort all over again. It's last resort in different language. Don't do this unless you think you have to, in which case prison's always there as the last resort. It's the backdrop, the default, the backup. It never has to prove itself. So my argument to you, my suggestion is that last resort essentially becomes the default, unfortunately. Prison is unquestioned, whereas everything else has to prove itself. And our research on the initial research on the the effect of the presumption found that it actually had little impact on sentencing decisions, though the Scottish government chose to extend it to 12 months. And as one sheriff put it, I think rightly, and I don't blame this person at all, but really when I'm 
imposing a short prison sentence is that's when we've run out of ideas. There's nothing else that's proving itself. And you can't blame these individual practitioners. It's wrong and lazy to do so. There isn't anything else that seems to be available. What we need to do as a society is to have a plan, a longer term plan, 10 to 15 years, and to say that unless we do this, um, cuts to community justice and community services more generally will, will suck in more needy people into prison. Not talking about people who have committed really serious offences. The people that we all know shouldn't really be going to prison, but there's nowhere else for them. And they're the people that go round, churning round and round the system. Last resort essentially lets off the hook, lets governments off the hook. It's not the fault of individual professionals. It actually allows governments to sort of shuffle off their responsibility about providing the services that should be there for people, not just justice services, but social services, and means that individual professionals are left to shoulder the impossible burden of chronic societal failures. What should we do? We need a plan to say that prison will no longer be the default. We have to say that prison must be justified. This can't be done overnight. You know, we need to set ourselves a target date, rather like climate change policy of saying by 2035 or 2040, this is what we're going to do. We're going to begin closing prisons and we're going to reinvest that money elsewhere. And that people should only get sent to prison if the seriousness of the offending demands it. But there has to be the services there. As I say, I'm not blaming individual judges and that practitioners, probation and so forth for that. I suggest the two-part principle that imprisonment should only be used if warranted by the seriousness of the offending. And rehabilitation is great in prison, but no one should go to prison as a ground for helping them. Politicians said to me recently, oh, but Cyrus, their offending may not be that serious, but while they're there, they can learn to read and write. A prison should not be, a prison is a place of secure confinement, first and foremost. It is not a school. It should not be a hospital. It is not a mental health facility and so forth. Uh, we need much more clarity about how we're using that precious resource. So that's more than enough for me. Um, if you find that of any interest and uh, or I'd be interested in your reactions, you can have a look at the last chapter in this recent book. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much indeed um, for um, listening and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Super. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'll ask actually now if the panelists could start their video. And I have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, and as I said, if anyone has any questions on any stage from the audience, please feel free to pop them in the uh, question and the Q&A box there at the bottom of the screen. But I'll, I'll get straight into it. A couple of meaty wants to start, which is great. So this one might be um, maybe for um, Theda, maybe, but we'll see um, if anyone has any comments they want to add either. So the question is from Carol Conway, who's the chair of the DOCA's visiting committee. And that's one of the, the female persons in the state. And she asked, which decision makers need to be influenced in order to see the change in resource allocation and practices that would result in a shift away from short sentences and towards CSO as the more common approach? So essentially, what are the barriers there that we need to dismantle to try and improve the, the resourcing of CSOs? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm still processing everything I've heard from um, Professor Cyrus Tata and also uh, Tom O'Malley, uh, you know, which does kind of reframe, I mean, that point that prison is always there and uh, a very interesting proposal that um, it, it should be, um, what would I say, it should be not accepted that someone is sent to prison for any reason other than the punitive purpose is really interesting. I mean, there is no lack of resourcing in community service orders. You know, there isn't a lack of uh, site placements and there isn't a lack of uh, community service supervisors and probation assistant staff to undertake it. So it's not a lack of resourcing. Um, community service in Ireland is a direct alternative to imprisonment. And, um, you know, so it, it's a high tariff sanction to be handed down. And this is where you need to consider, I mean, the comment was made earlier, I think, by uh, Professor Tom O'Malley, just about the, the volume of fines that are handed down as an alternative to higher tariff sanctions. 
So a question that we're all tussled with, and just to plug our evidence review again, a question that's engaged with in the probation service, evidence review of community service, is whether or not community service should be detached from that uh, sentence of imprisonment. So how it works is the judge decides that a, a sentence of imprisonment is appropriate and then you know, decides that uh, community service will be used in lieu of that punishment. And if a person doesn't fulfill the community service hours, they can be returned to prison. So it's a high tariff sanction. You know, and we do have, you know, um, what, what we don't really have sight of or what we might even be concerned about is people getting repeat community service orders instead of a probation order, for example, or a perception that's an alternative to the, the lowest sanction level. So really, and, and just to tie back in, what we need is the sentencing data to really understand what is happening. And I also mentioned in my presentation, and we welcome this, Department of Justice has commissioned research to understand the judicial making, uh, you know, so what's happening behind the decision to give someone a short term sentence instead of a community service order. So in, in the absence of that, but just to underscore, it isn't a lack of resources in community service. At the same time, just picking up on our last speaker, uh, you can't get away from the chronic social uh, and economic factors in the community. Housing is the largest one. It's not just an elephant in the room. It's a herd of elephants in the room. You know, Irish prison service statistics are approximately 7.8% of people are of no, no fixed abode. That's what they declare. We know the numbers are much higher than that. Nobody wants to say they've got no home because they'll be held longer in prison for want of an address to go on the outside. We know from research on the interdepartmental group looking at um, mental health, people with diagnosed mental health conditions in prisons. Now it's older research, but the rates of homelessness were more upwards of 25% or higher. So there is that piece. So if you're talking about a lack of resources, there isn't a lack of resources in community service or the delivery of that, but there are questions on housing, mental health, education, addiction services, everything else in the community. Okay, thank you very much for that. I think I'll move on then to the, the next question then, if that's all right. Um, and this is actually quite a specific question, so maybe I'm not sure it is something um, that you can directly answer to, if it's in relation to probation and community service again, but it's looking at the context of hate crime legislation in particular. So it's asking, has the probation service been in conversation or in contact with the Department of Justice on the importance of using CSOs and those types of alternatives to custody in the framework of that new hate crime legislation? Well, that's quite specific. So, Yeah, and, and certainly we can draw from experience in other countries that are ahead of us, I suppose, in approaching these, these areas of crime. So I suppose the first important thing to say is that the probation services were part of the Department of Justice. So as such, we're invited to make submissions internally and also we're welcome to initiate submissions um, to bits of legislation, and we do frequently. Um, I suppose the question really is about kind of responses to hate crime and certainly restorative justice as a response to hate crime has has great potential. Even at the community service end, so to give the most basic example, you can envision a situation of bespoke model where uh, somebody who has where there was a hate crime element to the offence that they committed is, for example, linked up with a community based organisation who provides services to the targeted group and that that person undertakes unpaid work for the benefit of the community that they have harmed. So there's great potential there. And we certainly know it has incredible impact, particularly with young people, and that's proven and the evidence shows it. Um, another thing just to mention that we, we work with our parole board in Northern, or the, sorry, the probation board in Northern Ireland. So we do a lot of sharing of expertise and interventions, particularly in the area of hate crime with internal uh, seminars and development in that area. So we're, we're, we're ahead of this, I would say, and um, look forward to responding to the legislation when it is introduced. Great, thank you. Um, the next question then is something again in relation to uh, community service. So again, I think Fee, but I think perhaps Professor O'Malley, you might have a view on this as well. So perhaps you both might just um, have listened to this one. And it's talking about the uh, community sanctions bill and about the possibility of maybe changing the role of judges so that they provide a sentence tariff on sentencing 
but then that sentence would be designed by the probation service or the sentence, what the sentence would actually look like would be the responsibility of another agency like the probation service. So that's yeah. something maybe quite conceptual, but you might have views yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a possibility. Um, that I might have that uh, community sanctions bill. I don't know if it's even a bill. Uh, the last time I saw it, it was the heads of a bill that were prepared, I would say, about a decade ago. I have never seen a piece of legislation make its way through the system so slowly as that one. Um, and there are some good elements to it. I mean, one of the things that uh, I think I was particularly anxious to see remain in it was what would be the essential uh, purpose of the probation service, because as we know, under the Probation Act of 1907, which we have still on the statute books and which was quite an enlightened piece of legislation in its day, by the way, um, it is the role of the probation officer is to guide, assist and befriend that famous expression, the, to guide, assist and befriend the uh, people under their supervision. And uh, I think uh, the last version of the uh, sanctions bill that I saw still retained that. I think that's certainly a welcome uh, development in it. The question, I, I, if I understand it, would be something like that a judge would impose, if you like, a community sanction and leave it then to another agency such as the um, probation service to determine what exactly that would be. It's a possibility, though, it could well give rise to a constitutional issue in this country where, uh, you know, one of the most famous sentencing cases in one of the most famous constitutional cases in the area of sentencing is the Deaton case in the early 60s, where it was held that it had something sort of constitutional to allocate to anyone other than the trial judge a determination as to what the sentence should be. In that particular case, for example, which is a customs case, and the revenue commissioners were entitled to elect what penalty should be imposed on the offender. The Supreme Court held, and of course it held again, very emphatically in the Ellis case just about two or three years ago, that there can be no question whatsoever of uh, allowing anybody other than the trial judge to determine what the punishment for an offence should be. Now, what we're talking, the, the question arises, I suppose, a kind of a threat, uh, the question, you know, as to whether what's being proposed would or would not um, do so. But I, I don't really see that as a problem. I think, you know, already, for example, you know, I mean, a judge imposes a community service order for so many hours, it's really up to the probation service then to administer that and to ensure that the person gets appropriate work and so on. Uh, as Fiona was saying, there's, I think, a provision now is there whereby they can uh, allocate a certain amount of those hours to education and training. So um, I wouldn't see that as necessary. I, I think that the present system, uh, in terms of the basic structure, works okay. It's more a question of ensuring that the resources are there for the probation service to be able to uh, perform its work properly. Great, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next question. This is actually one for Professor O'Malley again, and it's to do with um, historical sexual offending. Um, uh -huh. And we have a question from uh, it's Dr. Catherine Norton, and she's wondering that whether it might be more appropriate in those um, types of cases that the person be referred to psychological services and maybe the probation service rather than prison, just given that not in every circumstance, but often in cases there may be um, a, a, a history there justifying more psychological supervision mm -hmm. or input rather than um, being put in prison where they mightn't have access or you know that much access to psychological yeah. supports. Mm -hmm. you don't need well, I have to say, as time goes by, I find the prosecution of some of these historic sex offence cases quite troubling because some of them do go back a very long time, sometimes back 40 or 50 years. And uh, very often the person would have been a juvenile uh, in the sense of a person under the age of 18 years when they committed the offences in question. Now, there are, you know, we always have to remember that the, the victims may still be suffering as a result of it. So that's a factor that we have to take into account but, um, I mean, I think uh, just make one kind of point that's not a direct answer to the question. It's very often assumed that the conviction and the sentencing of the offender, even after 30, 40 or 50 years, uh, will have a beneficial or a kind of a cathartic impact on the victim. And I've no doubt that sometimes it does. What we don't 
do, or what we're very bad at doing, and to the best of my knowledge we haven't done, is to do any research on what the long-term uh, effect of the victim would be. In other words, the victim might feel vindicated on the day the sentence is passed, but does that solve their problem uh, in the long term? How do they feel about it, let's say, a year later? How do they feel about it when the offender has been released from prison, having served the sentences? And I've come across cases where they didn't feel very well at all. So it can be something uh, of a mistake at times to, to, to assume that the criminal proceedings, if you like, are the panacea to all of the problems that victims quite understandably, and as we know, experience uh, by way of the long-term effects of child abuse. So in relation then to referring them to psychological counselling, what that should certainly be done if they need it. And again, of course, very often the person will have led a crime-free life for decades since they actually committed the offences in question. So it doesn't necessarily follow that they do have any particular needs at the time of sentence. But uh, what might be more, uh, and sometimes that might be needed as well. Obviously, if it's a, a recent case, well, then that would be a very viable option. But again, of course, there will be strong pressure there to impose some punitive element as well. But I think that when it comes to dealing with um, to dealing with uh, historic offending, uh, unless, of course, it was of a very serious nature, and sometimes it is because it may involve, and I have been in such cases where, you know, the offender abused one or more of his children every single day for 10 years or more. So you're talking about very serious cases indeed. Uh, but in other cases where that is not the case, uh, where the, the offending is not quite so severe, then I think something other than imprisonment could be a viable option particularly, let's say, the use of a suspended sentence in those circumstances. But certainly, if the person does appear to be in need of uh, psychological counselling, well, then they should get that, because that would be far more effective in preventing recidivism than simply sending them to prison. OK, thanks for that, Professor O'Malley. I have a question for Cyrus now as well, again, from uh, Carol Conway, who is, the, as I said, the chair of the visiting committee for the Ondokos female prison. and she said that your presentator puts her in mind of the, the field of dreams in relation to prisons. If you build it, they'll come. Like if you build a prison, they'll fill it. Um, and she's just wondering, what is it that we need to build or what do we need to do so that we can divert elsewhere? And then who do we need to persuade or who do we need to be, um, you know, influencing to look for that radical shift in direction? Because it is a radical shift, as you said yourself, from decades of, you know, the same policy. So what is it? Yeah. No pressure, but what is it yeah. that we need to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, obviously, I don't have all of the answers. However, you know, as you say, we've been trying this for five, six decades. And, you know, with uh, I've, I've tried to show that with little success and indeed counterproductive. Um, and of course, it's not easy to turn around the tanker, as it were. Um but I, I would say the first, you know, if you're looking for a first step, and I noticed there was another question along the lines of what should be the first step in that change. I would say the first step has to be the one that people are really worried about, which is the public. Um, everyone's considered, obviously, politicians have to be rightly responsive to the public mood. And I think what you need to do is to do more research into what do the public think? What do they feel? What do they believe? The international evidence and the, there's been a little bit, I think, in Ireland shows that the that in general, members of the public are not nearly as punitive as we have tended to assume that they are or the some sections of the media assume they are, um, especially when you ask them, you know, about specific kinds of cases. What would you do in this case? rather than just in very abstract questions, should we be tougher on sex offenders? Should we be tougher on rapists? Of course, everyone's going to say yes. It's almost <laughs> absurd to say no to that. Um, but when you actually ask people and give them the kind of difficult information which professionals have to deal with, members of the judiciary, probation, all the rest of it, prosecutors have to deal with, they are far more thoughtful than we, you know, we might give them the credit for. And I mentioned that that tripartite, I call it the holy trinity um, the, of, of the so solution. Namely, you need to know people's preferences in those scenarios. You can do that quite easily. Say, okay, what do you think should happen? You need to ask them, what do you think actually, well, what do you think normally does happen? And they will probably assume that it's far more lenient than what they would prefer. And then when you've got the data about what 
happens in practice and this doesn't need to mean that you've got like you know you have to have collect you know hundreds of thousands of pieces of data about cases you can do sort of selective sampling as we suggested in our report to the guidelines and information committee of the judicial council you can then get a sense of what is typical and then you've got the potential to tell that really powerful story that says well actually this is what does happen for example in england and wales they found in research that most people believe that those convicted convicted of rape and robbery convicted of rape and robbery did not receive a custodial sentence and that's simply mistaken that's completely out of line with the reality and you would probably be able to show something similar in ireland which is a good news story for the justice system to say to people. So this idea that people just want ever more punishment may be premised on misinformation and misunderstanding. So I would start there. If you're going to, if you just had one place to start, I think that's the politically most powerful story you can tell. And it kind of undercuts the argument saying we need to build more prisons because as she says, build them, we'll fill them. We'll fill the prisons, build more roads, we'll fill them with more traffic. We know that. You wanted to come in there, yeah, just a bit, and just say I, I agree entirely. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot of when you you empower people with information, they understand the decisions and they arrive at uh, the same, if not better, better responses. Just an example that I'm really curious about from Ireland. So in 2001, we introduced detention as a last resort for children in the Children Act 2001, and also that children cannot be detained for welfare reasons, which aligns with what um, uh, Professor Tata is saying. And in the 10 to 15 years after that, what's interesting is that we saw investment in the alternatives, in youth diversion programs, in young persons probation. But at the same time, there was investment in, in building in, in facilities um, in terms of the uh, children detention school um, campus up in Oberstown. But what they did was they capped the numbers. It was a really brave decision to cap the numbers, you know, so it was a reduction essentially in the number of spaces available for, for children detention. It was approximately 50 in the adult prison system and approximately 30 or 35 in Oberstown at the time. And they built a facility for 45 to 50 mid region of up in Oberstown. And then that kind of forced, I would say, uh, the introduction. Um, it wasn't difficult, you know, that people wanted to look at things like the bail supervision vision scheme as alternatives, but it's largely been successful. Largely, you know, children are not sent to uh, detention in Ireland. It is used as a last resort. It's used less for welfare reasons, although that's still still a problem. And I know there are pressures in the system now, again, linking into those kind of social and policy, you know, difficulties in the community. But we do actually have a really good example in Ireland, albeit with a specific group with different needs, um, just in terms of turning that around. So. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. That's uh, a great observation, something we all need to kind of take on board and not be totally despairing maybe going forward. Um, I'm just conscious we've very much gone over time, as I suspect it might happen. And we, we've actually a lot of questions there, but I'll just maybe put one more question in the interest of time to the panel, because I don't want to keep everyone uh, for too much longer. And this is a question from um, uh, Connor in um, La Kayla, uh, and linked to Overstein as well. And it's kind of more, you might all have kind of a little bit of a comment that's more kind of a looking for general observations from you. But he's wondering, would you agree that community initiatives to aid the most marginalised in avoiding the revolving door? Um, sorry, now it's just, oh, it's just jumped on me there. One second now, sorry. Sorry. Would you agree that community initiatives to aid the most marginalised in avoiding the revolving door can be ineffective if the staffing and support of that community and justice sector are lacking in their own stability. And by lack of stability, he's talking about if there's lack of training, understaffing, burnout, and most commonly, a lack of financial stability. Um, and I suppose, is it maybe a case that too much is being left to, or too much is, you know, being the community side is being relied on too much to try and step in and kind of stop this revolving door? And I suppose it comes back to, again, We've all kind of touched on that maybe greater cooperation um, between the, all the justice sector and the different agencies that are involved. I so wonder if you have any observations or comments on that. Um, yeah, I mean, there is uh, 
of course, an awful lot to be said for that. I mean, absolutely the, part, the, the questioner is absolutely right. It just brings one thing to mind. Uh, this is a matter, if you like, of judicial sentencing policy, uh, but it's always there in the background. And that is, of course, that when, you co- when it comes to uh, sentencing minor offenders, and they're very often in the, com- in the category we're talking about, I'm talking about shoplifting, I'm talking about public order and areas like that. Very, very few judges, district court judges in this country would ever send such a person to prison for a one-off offence. The problem is, of course, that they are talking about somebody who has a very long list of previous convictions. And so very often people are being sentenced on their record rather than for the particular offence of conviction. And it's a question of how do you break that cycle? I mean, in this country, the general principle is that previous convictions are irrelevant unless they are of a similar nature to the existing offence. So that's something that usually arises in serious cases. But there is actually a point of view, which you see in some of the literature on the topic, which is that perhaps previous convictions should be seen as a mitigating factor rather than an aggravating factor, in that they reflect the fact that the person has been living in circumstances, has had suffered childhood adversity, and a whole lot of other factors that are more conducive to offending and that that is, you know, that's the message that previous convictions should send out rather than, if you like, to use an old fashioned term, incorrigibility. Um, so, yeah, I mean, definitely breaking the cycle is very, very important indeed. And looking at the factors that can, uh, that can uh, if you like, predict offending by young people in particular, because that's where it usually starts. Um, and we can do that. But again, uh, I, I think there's a lot, I think there would be a lot of public support for that, incidentally, uh, if it's explained properly, which goes back to a kind of a recurring theme of this particular seminar. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just conscious of time. As I said, we've gone 10 minutes over, so I might uh, just wrap up then. So apologies to anyone whose questions I didn't get to ask. Just unfortunately, there's just um, too many to get through in the time we had. So just to say, um, I really personally learned an awful lot in the seminar today. It was a really insightful and really fascinating selection of papers from um, three leading experts on this topic. And it really gives us a sense of how nuanced and very far reaching this area of the law is. So thank you to the three speakers, to Professor Tom O'Malley, Professor Cyrus Tata and um, Deputy Director of the United Canada for taking the time to present to us today and um, for sharing your expertise and your vision and for participating in the Q&A so fully as well. It's a pleasure to hear from such engaged and experienced subject experts. Um, thanks to all of the audience as well, everyone for attending. Thank you for your patience at the start with the, the little teething problems with the registration um, and for taking the time out of your schedules to listen and engage with these speakers. Um, it's not something we take for granted here at IPRT. Um, and it's really heartening to see so many people uh, engage and interested in this very uh, niche topic as such. Thanks also to my IPRT colleagues as well for all their work uh, with me in organising the event. Um, before I sign off, just a few notes on behalf of IPRT. Uh, hopefully you'll have seen there was a link posted in, the, in uh, one of the boxes there about how to become a member of IPRT. Should you be interested, we'd be delighted to welcome you. Uh, when you leave the webinar shortly as well, a short survey should pop up if there's no other technical mishaps uh, and it's just five short questions if you could take a minute to respond that would be great and then finally just to say that we have added new materials about sentencing to our website more will follow in the coming weeks so please do follow us and keep an eye on our socials for these updates we intend these uh, documents and information as kind of a helpful resource to expand on the offering we have already on this complex legal topic and we hope that they will be of assistance So with that, I just want to say uh, goodbye and thank you very much for everything and take care. Thank you.